Mystery of the Strange Bundle by Enid Blyton. Pip lay in his bed and thought of all the miserable holidays they'd had, this just about beat the lot. Why Betts had to start them off on this awful flu, he just couldn't imagine. Well, I couldn't help it, Pip. Someone gave it to me before I gave it to you others. You get it as soon as the Christmas holes begin, then you give it to Daisy, and she gives it to Larry, and then I get it. And poor old Fatty. What a mess up of the holes. Hardly any of them left now. All right. If you're going to be such a crosspatch, I'll go and see Fatty. Bets, tell Fatty I'm feeling better, and ask him to get on the track of some mystery at once. We've only got about ten days of the holes left. All right, but Fatty can't just spin a mystery out of thin air, Pip. Fatty can do anything. I've been lying here remembering all the mysteries we've ever solved with old Fatty. And all his disguises and the tricks he's played on Mr Goon. Oh, yes. I'm going. I'll bring back a mystery for you if I can. Bring some peppermints too. You must be feeling better. Bets put on her outdoor things and took some money out of her money box. She meant to buy Fatty, short for Frederick, something too. Bets had been a very faithful visitor and friend to the rest of the find outers while they'd had the flu and had spent nearly all her Christmas money on them. She walked down to the village and bought some enormous bullseye peppermints, half for Pip and half for Fatty. She came out of the shop in time to see Mr. Goon, the village policeman, sail slowly down the road on his bicycle. He saw Betts and put on his brakes too quickly. His bicycle skidded on the slippery surface and Mr. Goon found himself sitting down very suddenly in the middle of the road. Oh, Mr. Goon, are you hurt? That's all I get for wanting to ask after your friends down with this ear flu. They're getting better. Pity. It's been a real change for me not having that boy sticking his nose into my business all the time. To say nothing of that little pest of a dog. Well, I'm off. Goodbye. Good morning, Mrs Trotville. Hello, Bets. I think Frederick must be feeling better today. I've heard the most peculiar noises coming from his room. Come along, I'll take you up. Who is it? I've got a visitor, Mother. What on earth? Mrs Trotville looked astonished. Fatty appeared to be sunk deeply in his pillows. Bets could see his hair, but that was about all. His visitor was a plump, bespectacled woman with a black hat pulled over her forehead. She spoke in a mincing kind of voice. Betts was puzzled. Why didn't Fatty sit up? She poked him hard. He just lay there like a log. Betts glanced at the visitor, who had now got up and was looking out of the window, her back to them. Mrs. Trotville turned back the bed covers. There was no fatty there. Just a dark wig over a pudding basin and a bolster laid in the bed. Where was fatty? But Betts knew where he was, of course. Fatty, you're your own visitor. <laughs> Frederick, are you out of your mind? Get those clothes off and back into bed at once. Oh, those awful clothes. Where did you get them? Cookie brought them from an old aunt of hers. The dirty old things. I really must tell Cook not to unload her aunt's old clothes onto you. Mother, don't say a word. I've got to get proper disguises from somewhere. All right, Frederick, we won't say any more. Bets can take the things down to your shed when she goes. Uh, Mother, can Bets stay and have lunch with me? Uh, well, um, w w would you like to stay, Bets, dear? And promise me that you won't let Fatty play the fool. I promise. Thank you, Mrs Trotville. 
I'll telephone to your mother. Now, Bets, spill the news. Larry and Daisy are much better. And how's Pip? He's better, except in his temper. Oh, and I met Mr Goon this morning. Ah, the great Goon. And what did he have to say? Well, he said gah and fell off his bicycle. And what else had he got to say? He said it was a good thing you were in bed and out of mischief. Ha, <laughs> things will happen as soon as I'm up. A mystery, do you mean? Oh, fatty! Yes, a mystery. Even if I have to make one up. I wish a real mystery would turn up again. But there isn't time now. We'll all be back at school before we could solve it. Never mind. We'll have some fun with old goon first. I think I can hear dinner coming. Yes, it's your mother. I'll go and help her with the tray. The two ate their soup in a pleasant silence. A distant bark of fatty Scotty dog Buster came to their ears. Fatty was missing him and persuaded Bets to ask his mother if Buster could come up to his bedroom. They finished their soup and Bets took the dishes down to the kitchen. She came back with a tray loaded with plates of roast chicken and vegetables. Fatty began to tuck in. Yes, certainly Fatty was on the mend. Bets delivered the tray of empty plates and asked about Buster. Mrs. Trotville said that she wouldn't mind as long as Fatty had a rest first. Bets went back upstairs to tell Fatty the good news. You go to sleep, and when you wake up, bang on the floor with this stick, and I'll come up with Buster. Good. But don't go, Bets. I don't like being left alone. Don't be silly. Well, Bets, you must stay with me. Because of the voices. What voices? I don't know. Sometimes it's a duck, I think. And at other times it's a hen. And once it was a dog. What? Here in your bedroom? Fatty, you must have had a very high temperature to think you heard voices. I tell you, there are voices. There's a silly old man, too, who keeps asking for a cigarette. Oh, Bets, do stay with me. All right, I'll stay. But I believe you're making it all up, Fatty. Oh, Bets, will you believe me if you hear them? See that china duck on the mantelpiece? Well, I've heard that quacking. And see that dog in the picture? He barks and whines. You lie down, Fatty. You're dreaming or just being silly. Fatty lay down. Bets sat in the chair. Soon, both of them were asleep. Then Bets woke up with a jump. <coughs> Bets almost jumped out of her skin. She gazed incredulously at the china duck. Was this one of Fatty's voices? <coughs> Bets was glued to her chair. <coughs> and then a quavery old voice came from the wardrobe in the corner. Fatty, wake up! Your voices are here! <sighs> oh, what is it? Oh, oh, did you hear them too? Hark, the old man again! Look at the wardrobe! A uh, cigarette, please, sir? Eep, 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 eep. <laughs> oh, Fatty, what is it? Fatty, I'm frightened! Oh, Bets, don't cry! I, I thought you'd guess what it was at once! Guess what? Well, well, it's a bit of a secret, Bet. I'm practising to be a ventriloquist, that's all. But was it you, then, making that duck quack and that old man asking for a cigarette? It can't be you, Fatty. It is, though. I've been working on it all last term. How do you do it? Um, a cigarette, please, sir. Oh, Fatty, you are clever. How do you manage to throw your voice somewhere else, though? Well, a chap came to our school last term to entertain us. He was a ventriloquist. He was absolutely super. I honestly couldn't see either his mouth or throat working. I haven't the faintest idea how they do it. But you must know, Fatty, because you ventri ventrilo... Ventriloquise. 
Well, I do know a bit now, but I've had to get it out of books. Did you have to practice yourself then, with nobody to help you? Well, we've got a boy at our school, a Zulu prince or something. It's an old talent with Zulus, apparently. Anyway, when he knew I was trying to learn to throw my voice, he showed me a few tricks. Tell me, Fatty, what tricks? Well, first of all, I'll explain the name ventriloquism. It comes from two words, venta, which means tummy, and loqui, which means to speak. In other words, a ventriloquist was supposed to be a man who could speak by using his tummy in some way. Do you use your tummy, then? If so, you ought to have a jolly fine ventriloquist voice. <laughs> Don't be rude. As a matter of fact, the tummy is not used. A ventriloquist forms his words in the ordinary way, but he lets his breath escape very slowly, and he closes up his glottis, his throat, as much as he can, and opens his mouth as little as possible. Oh, and he only uses the tip of his tongue. You are clever, Fatty. Do some more. Just a cigarette, please, sir. Fancy you being a ventriloquist. Whatever will you be next? Oh, there's Buster. Bet, don't say a word to my mother about my ventriloquist stunt. Oh, mercy, Buster, mercy! Oh, Frederick, put it down outside the bed. Oh, that's right, Buster. If you dare get on the bed again, I'll set the cat on you. <coughs> Frederick, listen, it's almost tea time. I'll go down and Bets can get it in ten minutes. Are you going to tell the others about your ventriloquism? Will you teach them too? No, I shan't teach them. It's the practising. You make all kinds of queer noises then, and people don't like it. No. I can't see Mother being very pleased if Pip tried to learn. She says he's noisy enough already. Three days later, all the find-outers were completely themselves again. They went for their first walk together that holiday to the little dairy. Hello there. What would you like to order? A uh, hot chocolate and currant buns, please. I'll pay. Oh, thanks, Larry. <coughs> Be quiet, Buster. Don't bark at that dear old lady. He's not. It's Mr. Goon. I hope he keeps out of here. Me too, Pip. Look at that model cow on the mantelpiece. I do like it. I'm going to set its head nodding. Oh no! Goon's come in. Put this dog on a lead. I won't have him dancing round my ankles. Come here, Buster. Yeah. A cup of cocoa and a bun, please, miss. Here we are, Mr Goon. Well, you children, I've had a nice, quiet time these holidays. You must have felt funny not being able to stick your noses into a mystery. Or have you got a nice, juicy mystery to make a mess of? Now, how did you hear that, Mr Goon? Larry, have you been saying something about our latest mystery? Which case do you mean, Fatty? The mystery of the red-nosed reindeer? Or the one about the flying saucers? We've solved them both, haven't we? Oh, yes. I didn't mean those. No, Larry. I meant the mystery of the strange voices. Ah, strange voices. Oh, yes. That mystery's not solved yet, is it? Curious case, that. People hearing strange voices that aren't really there. Baby talk. You may be right, but believe it or not... Some people lately have been hearing ducks quack where there are no ducks, hens clucking, and people speaking. And yet, there don't seem to be any there. You tell me that cow on the mantelpiece will start to moo next. <laughs> Bosh and rubbish. It's a nice cow, isn't it? Its head is still going up and down. <clears throat> uh, nice cow that of yours, my good woman. Very lifelike. You'd almost expect it to moo. Oh, you will have your jokes, sir. My, if I heard it moo, I'd think I was going crazy. That's just what we were saying. Strange voices are about. People are hearing them. I'm glad I don't hear them. Oh, well, we live in funny days, no doubt about it. Now, I must go back to the kitchen. Talk. 
do talk, I'm going to laugh. Deep, 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 deep. That duck. Did you hear it? What's duck? Oh, Mr. Goon. Surely you're not suggesting that duck in a glass case is quacking? Mr. Goon, don't say you're hearing the strange voices. Deep, 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 deep. Ah! Ah! I'm all... <laughs> oh, Fatty, how do you do it? Honestly, I could have believed myself that the cow was mooing. So would I. It was so funny. I could hardly keep my giggles down. Mr. Goon's face. Now all we need is something exciting to happen. It was strange that she said that. Because that very night, something did happen. They didn't know about it till the next morning. The milkman told Larry, a break-in at the Cedars, the small house next door but one, rented by a Mr. Fellows who lived there alone. Apparently somebody had broken in and rifled the house from top to bottom. The milkman had found the door open and a window broken at the back. He had peeped in, seen the mess and phoned the police. Mr. Goon was already there. Larry got on his bicycle and went to tell Fatty. They collected Pip and Bets, fetched Daisy, and all five of them, with Buster, went up to the house. It didn't look as if anyone was there. Mr. Goon must have come and gone. Good. Now then, examine all the paths and beds round the house. Look for the usual things. And we'll compare notes later. Aren't you coming with us? No, I'm going to look in at the windows and see if there's anything interesting inside. Oh, confound it. Can't see in anywhere. All the curtains are drawn. Doors are locked too. Ah, oh, here's the broken window. Now, if I reach in, I can... Just move the curtain aside. There. Goodness, what a mess the kitchen's in. Gosh, it's a kitten. Here, there's a kitten left in the house. What shall we do? Rescue it. How? All the doors and windows are shut tight. Well, this one's broken. I think I could put my hand through the broken pane Undo the clasp and open the window. Then I could get in and rescue the kitten. Well, go on then. <sighs> I can just reach. I've <laughs> done it. Now I'll get in. Puss, Puss, come back here. What's up? Daisy says if you'll hand the kitten out to her, she'll take it home. Right, but I'll have to find it first. The kitten was nowhere to be seen. Fatty took the opportunity of having a good look around. Everywhere was in confusion. And then, as he came out from a bedroom onto the landing, Fatty saw something in a corner. It was bright red. He picked it up and spoke to himself aloud. A child's glove. For a very small child. Could Mr. Fellows have been hiding a child here? Kidnapped it, perhaps, and the other fellow came to find it. No, people don't look for children in drawers. Well, I'll keep the glove, just in case. Fatty, quick, Goon's coming back. Almost before Fatty had had time to get downstairs, there came the sound of Goon's angry voice. Then came the sound of Buster's barking. Fatty grinned as he heard Goon's familiar expressions. Interfering with the law! Clear off! But it was his threat to report them to their parents that decided the others it was time to leave. They stood outside the front gate, wondering what Fatty was going to do. Unfortunately for Fatty, he opened the front door from the inside at the same moment that Mr. Goon unlocked it from the outside. Good morning, Mr. Goon. Do come in. What are you doing here? I heard the kitten mewing. 
I came into the house to find it. Ah, this here house is absolutely empty. I hope you believe in the kitten now, Mr. Goon. Ah, take it away. And take yourself off, too. You'll be careful of the dog here, won't you, Mr. Goon? There's no dog here. A kitten I might have missed, but not a dog. What's that? It sounded like a dog. What a horrible animal it must be. I think I'll go and leave you to tackle him. You come and help me find that dog. It might want two of us to get him. All right, Mr. Goon. If you think it's my duty to stay and help you... Hmm. Nothing in this room. Did you hear that? That grunting noise? It sounded out in the hall. Yes, it did. You go first, Mr. Goon. Oh, I'm scared. It's a pig. Sounded upstairs that time. How was it I didn't see it this morning? Hmm? Shall we go upstairs to find the pig? Yes, but be careful. The dog doesn't rush at you. You go first, Mr. Goon. Oh, no. No. You go first. I'll be uh, right behind you. There's a man somewhere here. We'd better get help. Look, you stay here, Mr. Goon, and I'll go and get help. No, don't leave me here alone. Can't you stay here while I get help? Look, there's a telephone. You'd get someone here in a trice then. Mr. Goon rushed to the telephone and got through to Constable Kenton. And as Fatty tiptoed silently out of the front door, he heard Goon describing the strange noises to the constable at the other end. I'm send someone up here at once. There's a fierce dog in the house and a pig. Yes, I said a pig. P-I-G. Yes, pig, you ass! And a groaning man who wants his auntie. Yes, I did say auntie. Are you deaf or something? Well, how do I know why he wants his auntie? Any more sauce from you, Kenton, and I'll report you. Come here at once! Fatty tiptoed round the side of the house and saw the broken window hanging open as he passed. He thrust his head inside and sent a terrible growl into the house. Mr. Goon heard it. He looked around and found that Fatty had gone. He was alone. He fled at top speed out of the front door and didn't stop running till he came to the bottom of the road. How Fatty laughed. Fatty's laughter echoed across the next garden and came to the ears of the others. They had retreated to Larry's garden to wait for Fatty. Larry gave the piercing whistle that the find-outers sometimes used. Fatty heard it and was soon in the garden with the others. What had happened, they wanted to know. Fatty told them and soon they were all helplessly holding their sides, laughing. Just then, Mr. Goon came up the road with P.C. Kenton. The children watched the two policemen disappear into the burgled house. I bet Goon's friend will be puzzled to find the house completely empty of dog, pig, man and kitten. I'm so glad you found the kitten and brought it here, Fatty. What a wonderful morning. I've forgotten all about the flu. What do we do now, Fatty? I want to know if you've anything to report to me. We didn't get much. We've pulled our notes together, and here's a short report. Oh, good work, Larry. Far ahead. We went all round the house. We found out where the burglar came in. Over the wall at the bottom of the garden. How do you know that? There's a flower bed there. And there are some very deep imprints of feet, made by someone jumping down from the wall. Got a drawing of the prints? Of course. Right. Go on. We traced the footprints to the back of the house. There's a half brick just below the window. We think he broke it with that. Yes, probably. That means someone might have heard him. We'll find out. Any more? Yes. 
there are other footprints, different ones, going from the front door, across the beds there in the front of the house, then on a bit of gravel path that leads to the back gate, then no more. I see. So you think someone else, probably Mr Fellows say, ran out of the front door, across the flower beds to the back gate and disappeared out that way? Yes, and that's all our notes. And jolly good too. Now, just let me think a bit and try to piece together exactly what happened last night. Silence while the great mind works. This is how I see it. Somebody wants something out of Mr Fellows. What, we don't know. Something that Fellows won't want to give him. Yes, that sounds right. The man hides till he thinks it's safe to break in. In he goes. Fellows shoots out of the front door, leaving it open, and rushes out into the dark night. It was moonlight last night. You're right. Good for you, Daisy. Well, to go on, he fled out, possibly taking with him whatever it was that the other fellow had come for. The other fellow proceeded to turn the house upside down looking for it. Now, the thing is, what was it that fellows rushed off with? I think I found something that might help, though how I can't possibly imagine. Look. It's a doll's glove. Or could it have been a baby's? I don't think so. There wasn't anything in the house to suggest that a small child had been there. Only this glove. It couldn't have fitted a child of more than two. Where's your big doll, Daisy? I'll go and get her. Pip, did you take a drawing of Fellow's footprints? Gosh, yes, here. Rather funny prints, these. Flat and indistinct. I think Fellow's ran out in his bedroom slippers. This print isn't of proper shoes with heels. He may even have had on his night things and a dressing gown. He went out in such a hurry. Yes, you're right. It is the print of flat bedroom slippers. Larry, go and get yours. We could see what kind of footmarks you make in them. Right. Hang on a minute. I hope they're not long. It's getting very late. Oh, good. Here they come. I found a doll. It's certainly a big one. Let's try the glove. Well, whatever child this glove belonged to couldn't have been much bigger than your doll, Daisy. There. I've got my slippers on. Run over that muddy path by the wall. Right, let's see. Yes, they're very like Fellow's footprints. Do they look the same to you, Pip? Yes, exactly the same. Come on, Bets. We'll simply have to tear home. When's the next meeting, Fatty? Come to our house. Right, we'll meet this afternoon at half past three. Larry and Daisy went indoors while Pip and Bets shot off home. Fatty went more leisurely, his brain at work, thinking of Mr. Fellows. Where is he? Where did he put what he wanted to hide? Will he come back? When they met that afternoon, everyone was delighted when Fatty announced that he really thought this may be a mystery. I vote we all get down to it at once. You all know the few clues we have. Yes. We know how the man got into the house, but does anyone know how he got away? Any ideas? Yes. We think he went out of the front door. We thought we could make out a few of his footmarks on the front path. I see. And didn't bang the door in case it attracted attention to him. It's a pity we can't find anyone who saw either of the men wandering about in the middle of the night particularly fellows in his slippers and presumably dressing gown. I don't see how we can. Another thing we ought to find out is the time the man entered the house. Larry, do you know the people at the house in between yours and Mr Fellows? Yes. The mother's help there has a boy. His name's Herb. He's a great bird fellow. Do you want me to ask him if he heard anything funny in the night? Oh, yes. See if we can get the time the burglar went in. Then we could perhaps find someone who saw fellows somewhere at that time. Who? Well, there are such things as night watchmen. Of course, especially as our roads are being done up now. 
There are night watchmen to guard the tools and things left beside the road. I'll go tonight. I shall probably feel like taking Buster out for a run. And I'll have a word with the boy next door tonight. I'll give you a telephone call, Fatty, if I can find out anything. Right. If you find out the time of the breaking of the window, I can ask the night watchmen if they saw fellows at some definite time. Daisy, how's the little kitten? Fine. Mr. Fellows must be worried about it. Starving in an empty house. He may come back. And if he does, that'll make a wonderful excuse to see him. I can take the kitten back and ask him all sorts of innocent questions. At that moment, Pip and Betts ran to the door and took in two large and well-loaded trays bearing a splendid tea of new-made scones hot and buttery, bread and butter and strawberry jam, potted salmon and shrimp paste and a large chocolate sponge cake. The children ate everything. Then Larry, Daisy and Fatty went to say goodbye and thank you to Mrs. Hilton and went off together. Larry and Daisy arrived home at a quarter past six and Larry went up to his room and found his new book on garden birds. Herb would love to borrow that. He went next door and knocked at the back door. Hello. I wondered if you'd like to borrow my new bird book. Come in. Let's have a look. Cool, it's a beauty. Ooh, here's a fine chapter on owls. I love owls. Did you hear any owls last night? Yeah, I did. What time did you hear them? They woke me about half past twelve. I got out of bed and watched for a while. Where does your bedroom face? Towards our house? No, it faces the one that was burgled last night. When I looked out, there was still a light on downstairs in the sitting room. I suppose you didn't hear any owls after that. Something woke me later on. It was a quarter past three. I went to the window and listened for owls again. Had the light gone out in the sitting room? Yeah, but I saw some kind of light in the kitchen. A torch, perhaps, or a candle. That sounds that woke you. Would it be breaking glass, for instance? Well, it might have been. Are you thinking about the burglary? I dare say that might have been glass breaking, I heard. Right. Goodbye, Herb. Larry went back home, telephoned Fatty, and told him the whole conversation. That night, Fatty went up to his bedroom at eight o'clock and waited till his parents went off to play bridge. Then, disguising himself with a pencil moustache, false teeth, a check cap and a tweed overcoat, he set off in the direction of the river. After a while, ahead of him, red lamps burned in a row, and in the midst of them was a watchman's hut. Good evening. Nice fire you've got there. You mind if I warm my hands? Warm them and welcome. Um, do you um, get many people late at night? I'll get the policeman, Mr Goon, and a fisherman or two. I wonder if you've ever seen my Uncle Horatius walks in his sleep. I, I suppose you didn't see him last night, wandering about in a dressing gown and bedroom slippers? <laughs> nah, <laughs> I didn't see him. But old Willie, farther along, he did say something about a chap in pyjamas last night. I'll go and have a word with Willie. Hello, who's this? Oh, blow! It's Goon! Fatty escaped into the shadows and hurried off to find Willie. He introduced himself as before and brought his Uncle Horatius into the conversation as soon as he could. I seed him. This ways I seed someone running by. Pajama legs and bedroom slippers he wore. But he weren't old, the way he ran along. Was he carrying anything? Yes, he were. I don't know what it was. You didn't see him come back, did you? Nah. Bother, goon! I must hide. Well, 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 Willie. You seen anyone suspicious last night? Well, you wouldn't be wanting an old uncle that sleepwalks and wears pajamas and slippers, would you? Funny. The watchman up the road asked me that. What was this fellow like who told you this fairy tale? Oh, young he was. 
Toolish. Moustache. Fattish too. Fattish? Yeah. Now you listen here, Willie. That fellow will come back this way. And I want to get my hands on him, see? I'm going to hide at the other end of the road. And when you see him coming, swing one of your red lamps to and fro. All right. Fatty heard all this and decided to play a little trick on Goon. He felt about the waste ground and found an old sack. He slid some stones into it, then slowly walked by the watchman, half bent under his load. The watchman saw him, but couldn't make out who it was. He decided that whoever it was looked suspicious. He picked up a red lamp and swung it slowly. Mr. Goon saw the swinging lamp and came quickly down the road. To his great annoyance, when he got to the hut, no one was there but Willie. The old man explained that he'd seen this suspicious chap with a heavy sack going past. Well, thought Goon, if he couldn't get his hands on that fat boy, it would be satisfactory to get them on someone else. He set off, tracking Fatty. Fatty took a quick look back. Good. Goon was on his trail. Down to the river plodded Fatty, shuffling like an old man. He went onto the jetty and sat down with his sack as if to rest. Now was Goon's chance. He emerged from the shadows and strode up to the jetty. He demanded that the old man should tell him what was in the sack. Fatty, in a weary old man's voice, said on the spur of the moment, it didn't belong to him, it belonged to Mr. Fellows. Then acted as if he was horrified at what he'd said. Goon was amazed and grabbed at the sack. Fatty stood up, picked up the sack, flung it down into the river and took to his heels. Fatty got home without any further adventure and fell into bed. At breakfast the next morning, the telephone rang. It was Larry. Is that you, Fatty? I say, Mr. Fellows is back. How did you know? Herb told me. He said he was awake last night, listening to his owls, when he heard a click at the gate next door. What time was this? He said it was about two o'clock in the morning. He went to his window wondering if it was a burglar again. But he said it was Mr. Fellows. He saw him clearly in the moonlight. What was he dressed in? He couldn't really see, but he thinks he had on a dressing gown. He wasn't carrying anything, though. So if he did rush out of the house with a parcel of some sort... He did! I found that out from a night watchman last night. I'll be along at your house after breakfast. Telephone Pip and Betts, will you? We'll have to think of our next move. Goodbye! See you later, Larry. Immediately after breakfast, Fatty took his bicycle and rode off to Larry's at top speed. He arrived out of breath. Pip, Betts, Larry and Daisy were watching for him. Daisy was holding the kitten. After a quick discussion, Fatty took the kitten and went up the road to the next house but one, Mr. Fellows. He went cautiously round to the back and looked in the broken window. Nobody was about. It was likely that Mr. Fellows would not answer any ringing or knocking if he was lying low, but somehow Fatty must get hold of him. Then a splendid idea came to him. It was quite likely that Mr. Fellows had been looking for the kitten. Fatty would stick his face close to the broken pane 
and meow as loudly as he could. A most pitiful, heart-rending meowing penetrated into the kitchen through the broken window. A man appeared at the inner door of the kitchen. He was a youngish fellow with a thin face and bright, intelligent eyes. The kitten mewed, and the man looked across to the window. He saw Fatty holding the kitten. Fatty spoke apologetically through the broken pane. Sorry to disturb you, sir, but this is your kitten, isn't it? Yes, yes, it's my kitten. Wait a minute, I'll undo the kitchen door. I say, sir, your burglary caused quite an excitement. The police were here. Did you know? The police? How did they know anything about the house being empty or uh, burgled? I'll tell you all about it, if you like, sir. You'd better come in. I'm afraid there isn't any milk. The milkman hasn't been this morning. No. I expect the police told him not to come, as you weren't going to be here. What is all this about the police? Well, you see, apparently burglars got in while you were away. Well, who gave the alarm to the police? Well, the milkman. He found the front door wide open and telephoned the police. This is, this is all news to me. What time did you leave your house, then? Oh, sometime that night. I went to visit a friend and stayed the night. I came back yesterday evening to find the house a little untidy, certainly, but nothing has been stolen as far as I can see. Who's that? Of all the brazen cheek, it's the police again. I'll put this fellow where he belongs. I certainly would if I were you. Open the door, sir. I have a few words to say to you. The window would do for him. What do you mean by peering in like this at my window? Hmm? Can't you see I'm talking to a friend? A friend? Is that boy your friend? I shall report you for this extraordinary behaviour. But there's been a burglary. There has been no burglary, and I'll clear off. Well, let me tell you that you've no right to go away and leave animals to starve in the house. The kitten is quite all right. Oh, what about the dog? And the pig, ho <laughs> And what about the fellow who wanted his auntie? Mr Fellows by now was quite convinced that Mr Goon was raving mad. He turned to speak to Fatty, but Fatty was not there. He had seen the chance to creep upstairs and examine bedroom slippers, dressing gowns and pyjamas. He'd picked up the kitten to provide him with an excuse for going upstairs and tiptoed out of the room. Fatty looked round the room and under the bed. Ah, a pair of red slippers lay there. Fatty turned them upside down and examined them. They were very muddy. Fatty slipped his hand under the eiderdown and pulled out pyjamas, striped red and white. The bottom edges were filthy, splashed with mud and clay. The dressing gown was hanging in a tall cupboard. It was dirty, but also messed up with hay and straw. Where had Mr. Fellows been in his dressing gown? Had he hidden in a barn or in a haystack and crept home in the middle of last night? The angry voices downstairs had stopped. There was the sound of a window being slammed shut. Fatty began calling. Kitty! Kitty! What are you doing up there? Oh, sorry, um, the kitten's run away. It's down here. Oh, uh, well, um, well, goodbye, sir. Fancy you not having a burglar after all. Well, I didn't. Now clear out now, I want some peace. When Fatty got back to Larry's, they held a very exciting meeting as Fatty described his adventures of the morning and the night before. Then all your reasoning was correct. Yes. But we still don't know what he took with him when he went, or where he's hidden it. I wonder where. We can't very well hunt in all the haystacks and barns round about Peterswood. Fellows is very careful in all he says. There's something going on. I wonder what it is. Do you think Mr Goon has got that sack of yours out of the river yet? No. Let's go down to the river and see if there's anywhere about. We can bike down. All right. We might as well. Ah, there's old Spicer getting his boats ready. Hello, Spicer. 
I suppose we couldn't have a boat this morning. Oh, no. <clears throat> I've only got the one ready. That, that Bobby rang up and asked me to have one ready for him this morning. Wants a boat hook, too. Seems like my boat hooks are popular this morning. He's the second one wants a boat hook. Who's the other fellow? I've never seen him before. Big, dark fellow. Got a scar down his cheek and something wrong with one eye. Not a nice piece of work at all, he wasn't. He offered me ten bob for the loan of my longest boat hook. Said he wanted specimens of the weeds from the river for some botanist fellow. I see. Well, um, cheerio. We'll wander along. It's very odd, you know. I don't believe that yarn about jabbing for weeds. Let's see if we can find the fellow. Don't let's go too far. I don't want to miss Mr Goon hunting for your sack, Fatty. Well, you four go and watch Mr Goon when he comes, and I'll saunter up the towpath and see if I can spot that other fellow. Fatty wandered up the towpath and soon saw the man coming towards him. He had a pail with him, out of which water weed was hanging. Fatty stopped as the man came up to him and offered to help him collect weeds. The man scowled and told him to buzz off. Fatty didn't buzz off. He merely sauntered on till he came to a clump of thick bushes. He disappeared into them and watched. The man went slowly on his way, looking into the water as he went, jabbing and prodding at times with the boat hook, but finding nothing of interest. Fatty grew bored. Had Mr. Goon arrived yet? Mr. Goon had. To the delight of the four watching children, Goon got into the boat and took the oars. The boat hook lay beside him. Off he went. He stopped rowing when he came to the wooden jetty, took up the boat hook and began to prod and jab in the water. He got nothing but water weeds until... Ah, what was this, he thought. His boat hook had really got hold of something this time. This must be the old man's sack. Mr. Goon heaved and hauled. It came up with a rush. Goon undid the string that tied the neck. He put in his hand. Stones. They would be to weight it down. Goon tossed them into the water. Rummaging deep into the bundle, he couldn't feel anything else except soft, dripping clothes. He drew something out, shook it. It was a small red coat. He delved again and brought out an array of small garments. Goon began to snort and his face grew purple. That boy! He must have been the old man. He'd spoofed Goon with a sack of doll's clothes. He shoved the clothes back into the bag again. He was boiling with rage. The four children, seeing Goon look so fierce, ran up the towpath at top speed to warn Fatty. Fatty, Goon's got some other sack, not yours. It was full of doll's clothes. You better go quick before he comes. He's simply furious. I'll pop into Spice's shed. I'd like to see what Goon does when he lands. Quick, Fatty. Where's that friend of yours? What friend? You know who I mean. He's in there. Fatty, look out. Ah, there you are. Gotcha. Uh. Thought you'd spoof me with a bag of doll's clothes, did you? <laughs> well, now, you can have them back. Nice, wet clothes stuffed down your shirt like this. Oh, stop it! You tore my shirt! Oh, oh no! Goon's fallen on top of Fatty. He'll squash him to death. Pip, help me pull him off. There. You got what's been coming to you for a very long time, Mr. Nosy Parker. Mr. Goon, you're a policeman. You shouldn't do things like that to a boy, too. Yeah, go and boil your head, Spicer. He's a bad lot and got what he deserved. Oh, Mr. Goon, I give you my word of honour. I've never seen these things before in my life. 
life! You put those things into that sack to spoof me. Oh. Now you've got them in the neck. <laughs> and what's more, <laughs> you can keep them. <laughs> I'm off! Mr Goon marched out of the shed. He bumped into the man with the waterweed who'd been watching. Goon snorted at him rudely and walked past. The children rallied round Fatty, who was bruised and battered. Betts wanted to tell the chief inspector about Mr Goon's shocking behaviour, but Fatty would have none of it. He felt that Goon had only got back at him for all the maddening things that he had done to Goon. Fatty was anxious to get home and change into dry clothes. The waterweed man stood watching silently. They rode on to Fatty's house and went to his shed. Larry, can you go indoors and get me some dry clothes? OK. Just look at these things Goon stuffed down my neck. Who could have been such an idiot to dump doll's clothes in a sack, weight them with stones and sink them in the river? It doesn't make sense. I'll take them to the dustbin. Here we are, Fatty. Nice dry clothes. Get changed. Oh, just a minute. I've still got something down me somewhere. Oh, oh got it. A red sock. It's not a sock. It's a little red glove. Let me see. A little red glove. Another one. The pair to the one I've got in my pocket. Look. Exactly the same. But what does it mean? You found the first glove in Mr Fellow's house. And Goon stuffed the second one down my neck. He's given us the biggest clue yet. Don't you see what it means? The bundle of clothes that Goon hooked up is the bundle that Mr Fellow's rushed off with and threw in the river. The bundle the other fellow was after. Oh, thank you, Mr Goon. But how do you know? Because I picked up one of the red gloves in Fellow's house. Oh, I see. But why are these doll's clothes so important? We'll get them and see. Daisy, Larry, go and haul them out of the dustbin again. We'll go through them carefully. There must be something to tell us why they're apparently of such importance. This is exciting. Ah, oh, here's Larry back. Here they are. But there's big trouble. Our mothers have been telephoning here to find out where we are. It's half past one. All our dinners are ready. We must go. Well, we'll have to wait till this afternoon. I'll take them up to my room and dry them by the electric fire. Promise you won't examine them till we get back? I promise. I hope you don't get into a row. They all left at top speed, fearing they certainly would get into a row. They did. Not one of the four was allowed to go down to Fatty's that afternoon. Fatty waited till three o'clock, then telephoned. He wasn't even allowed to speak to the others. He went up to his room and looked at the things he'd put in front of the fire. They were perfectly dry now. He bundled them up and put them in a drawer. The rest of the day was extremely dull. Fatty went to bed early and fell into a sound sleep. His parents were up in town that evening and would not be back until about one o'clock in the morning. He was suddenly awakened by Buster barking loudly. He sat up with a jerk and turned on the light. A quarter to one. Shut up, Buster. It's only Mum and Dad you can hear. Oh, all right. I'll get up and we'll go and see. Hey, that's odd. Mother's bedroom light is on. Oh, gosh, look at that. What a mess. We've had burglars. Where are you, Buster? I'm coming. There, boy. Oh, the sitting room window's open. Thank goodness they're back. out of bed. We've been burgled, Mother. I'm afraid your room's in a mess. Oh, my jewellery. I must go and look. Uh, tell Daddy to look around downstairs when he's put the car away. Right, then I'll come up. What a 
have they taken, Mother? It's funny. I can't see that anything has been taken. Even this pearl necklace I left on the dressing table. What did the thief come for? Oh, excuse me, Mother. The doll's clothes. Oh, thank goodness, they're still in the drawer. Well, there's something extraordinarily valuable about you. Maybe we'll find out tomorrow. To Fatty's relief, his father decided next day not to inform Mr. Goon of the attempted robbery. Mr. Trotville had no great opinion of Mr. Goon. Fatty telephoned the others, told them of the burglary, and told them to buck up and come down. Fatty was ensconced in the shed when the others came tapping at the door. He shut the door and locked it. He pulled the curtains over the windows and lighted the little oil lamp. Why all the mystery? That waterweed man is somewhere around, I bet. I don't want him peeping in at the window while we're examining the clothes. He's made two break-ins at different houses already to get them. Right, now for the clothes. The trousers first. No pockets. Don't dolls' clothes ever have pockets, Bets? Oh, yes, sometimes. Red belt for the trousers. Quite ordinary. Socks. There are no names on them. Dolls never have their names marked on their clothes, silly. Mine do. Pass the shoes, Fatty. Gosh, aren't they small? Yeah, small for a child, but big for a doll. Very nice shoes, though. Strong and well-made. Not like the usual doll's shoes. I suppose these clothes couldn't belong to some little dwarf child. Well, I suppose they might. But for the life of me, I can't see why they're so important. Here, Buster. Have a sniff at this shoe. Who does it belong to? <coughs> oh, Buster! Bring it back! Oh, don't take any notice of him. Look, here's the coat. I can't feel anything in the lining. You know, the longer we look at these things, the more puzzled I feel. Is that all the clothes? I can't think why they're important. Neither can I. I do wish we'd managed to find some clue hidden in them. Let me go through them once more, Fatty. They're all there, Bet, except the shoe that Buster took. Look, we missed this. A little handkerchief. And it's got a name embroidered on it. Where was it? There's a tiny pocket inside the coat cuff. What's the name on the hanky? E-U-R-Y-C-L-E-S. Eurycles. It's Greek, isn't it? Yes. Wait. I've heard it before. Eurycles. Of course, I remember now. What a clue. Who is he? Eurycles was a Greek who lived ages ago, and he was a ventriloquist. I thought ventriloquists were all modern. Good gracious, no, it's a very old art. But why should this doll's hanky have an old Greek ventriloquist's name on it? When hankies are embroidered with somebody's name, that name usually belongs to the owner of the hanky. Right, Mr Eurycles. What could he be but a ventriloquist? And what could these clothes belong to but his talking doll? Of course! Yes, I see daylight at last. Well, it's more than I do. We've only got to find Mr Eurycles and ask him why these clothes are so important. But how do we find Mr Eurycles? I'll telephone that place that sells things for conjurers and ventriloquists. They'll soon tell me if there's a Mr Eurycles. Or Mr Fellows might tell us. Yes. He might, and he might not. We'll take the clothes to him this afternoon and see his face when we show them to him. Right. Let's put them away till we're ready to take them. I'll stick them in this box. Now, I vote we go and have some hot chocolate at the dairy. And macaroons, please, waitress. Oh, no. Goon's just come in, and he's coming over. 
Are you all right? Why this sudden concern for my health, Mr Goon? Why shouldn't I be all right? Um, you heard from Chief Inspector Jenks lately? Not a word. Oh, see here, I, I want to talk to you. Friendly-like. It's like this. You remember that time we were in Mr Fellow's house together? Yes. Well, do you remember hearing a dog growl? And a pig grunt? And a man groaning? The one who longed for his auntie? Yes, I remember. Why? Well, I made out a report for the chief inspector, and I put it all in. I sent in the report, and the chief don't believe a word of it. He wasn't half snorty about it over the phone this morning, so I told him you were there too. You want me to back you up, I suppose? I bet you exaggerated everything in your report. Well, I may have let myself go a bit. Well, I'll back you up in the facts, but not in any exaggerations. Oh, thanks, Frederick. <laughs> We've had our scrapes, like, but I knew I could depend on you to back up the truth. Now, I'm off. Thank goodness he's gone. What does he want to go and write an idiotic report for? And now, as he's told the chief you were there, you'll be asked about it too. Blow, goon. Fatty paid the bill and they biked back to his house. Fatty threw his bicycle suddenly to the ground when they came to the shed and rushed up to the door with a cry. Someone's been here. The lock's forced. The door's ajar. Oh, Fatty. Look at that. That burglar fellow's been here and he's messed up everything. And what's more, he's taken those doll's clothes. Oh, Fatty, isn't this a blow? Listen, there's someone outside. Let me see. Oh, it's our gardener. I'll go and have a word with him. Poor old Fatty. What rotten luck. Not only losing the clothes, but the mess. He's coming back. It was the waterweed man, all right. The gardener said he had a scarred cheek. Blow, blow, blow. I'll never forgive myself for this. Let's tidy up. We can't leave you to put everything away by yourself. Come on, Daisy. Oh, look! The tiny hanky with the name embroidered on it. The thief must have dropped it. Well, you'd better keep it for yourself, Betts. It's not much good to us now. Thanks for clearing up, everyone. You ought to go. It's getting near dinner time. The four got on their bicycles, shouted goodbye and raced off. Fatty went slowly back to the house. He was very depressed. His mother greeted him with the news that the chief inspector had telephoned and would ring again after lunch. The telephone rang immediately after the meal was ended. Hello, this is... Ah, Frederick, good. I wanted to speak to you. Listen, I've had a report in from Goon, so extraordinary that I didn't believe it. When I telephoned him, he said that you would back him up. He said you were a witness. Quite, sir. Apparently, Goon went to inspect a house that was empty and that had been reported as burgled. He says there was a kitten mewing, a dog growling, and a pig. To crown everything, Goon reports there was a wounded man in the house crying out. Well... As soon as Goon told me you were in the house with him, I smelt a rat. Do you understand me? Uh, yes, I think I do, sir. Exactly what did you have to do with it? Well, sir, I've been practising ventriloquism. Good heavens! I didn't think of that. What a menace you are, Frederick. Yes, sir. I say, sir... There's a bit of a mystery on here, and I want to get hold of a ventriloquist myself. A man called Eurycles. Did you say Eurycles? I'm coming straight over. Keep your mouth shut till I come. Fatty put his receiver back, feeling rather dazed. Why was the chief so astonished? Did he actually know anything about Mr Eurycles? Fatty told his mother that the chief inspector was coming over 
and asked if she minded if the other four came along. She didn't mind at all. The chief arrived first, and with him came a tall, distinguished-looking man in plain clothes. Fatty was at the door and welcomed the chief. Sir, this is the boy I was telling you about. Let me introduce Frederick Trotville. How do you do, sir? Fatty shook hands solemnly. He noticed that the chief didn't tell him the tall man's name. It was obvious that he was a very big noise, Fatty thought, probably in the Secret Service or Scotland Yard. Now, first of all, Frederick, what do you know about Mr. Eurycles? Not much. I'd better tell you everything from the beginning, sir. Then you'll see how we finally arrived at Mr. Eurycles. Fire away. Oh, it's the others, sir. Do you mind if they come in too? Ah, fetch them in. I say, all of you, come in here, quick. Sir, may I introduce you to Daisy and her brother Larry? Pip and his sister Betts. Good afternoon, How do you do, sir. How do you do, sir? Inspector, what have you come for? Not just to see us. I came because I think you may have a tale to tell me that will help me in something else. Frederick was just about to tell it when you arrived. Sit down and we'll hear it. Fatty began again and told them everything that had happened. When he got to the part when the find-outers were waiting to see goons search the river for the sack and describe the waterweed man, this caused the chief and his plain-clothes friend to sit up straight and look at one another. The chief asked for a full description of this man. At this stage, the chief decided he would like goon at the meeting as well. Larry telephoned, and a few minutes later, Goon arrived, feeling very nervous. Sit down, Goon. We've been hearing an interesting tale and thought you should hear it too. Carry on, Frederick. Mr Goon found a sack, sir, but it wasn't the sack I'd thrown in. Mr Goon opened the sack and it was full of doll's clothes and a glove to match the one I'd found at Mr Fellow's house. So we took them home. Oh, wait a minute. How did you get them? Well, uh, Mr. Goon, um, he, um, well, gave them to me. Goon? What in the world made you hand them over to young Frederick? He didn't give them to him. He stuffed everything down his neck, shoes and all. Shoes? Did you say shoes? Hmm... Carry on, Frederick. We searched through the clothes and Betts found a handkerchief embroidered with the name Eurycles, a name I recognised. Why did you recognise it? Because I'm a bit of a ventriloquist and there was once a Greek called Eurycles who was a very famous ventriloquist. Remarkable. So you thought that the clothes must belong to a doll owned by a modern ventriloquist called Eurycles? Yes, sir. Well, you'll be interested to know that there is such a man, and the clothes do belong to his doll. We have been searching everywhere for them. Why? The chief inspector and I work to preserve law and order in our country. It is our duty to discover and watch any man or woman who is working against this country and its laws. Spies? Not only spies, but any man or woman of evil intent. Mr. Eurycles was one who helped us in this. Mr. Fellows was his assistant. Oh, so that's how he comes in. One day, one of Eurycles' friends gave him a list of names of people undermining every industry in our country. Eurycles put the information into his usual hiding place, in the clothes of Bobby Boy, his doll. That night, Eurycles was kidnapped with Bobby Boy. But the ventriloquist managed to throw the doll out of the kidnapper's car. Quite by chance, the doll was picked up by a police car. Mr Fellows had by then reported the kidnapping, so the doll was given to him. 
Apparently, he knew that Eurycles had hidden something of value in the clothes, but he had no idea what. So the kidnappers have been hunting for it ever since? Yes. So if you'll just produce the clothes, Frederick... It's awful to have to tell you, sir. The shed where we kept them was broken open, and all the clothes were gone. Ah, well, this is a setback. All the clothes went? Yes, except the hanky. But we can go down to the shed and have another look. Here we are, sir. This is the box we kept them in. Quite empty. The shoe buster took. Did we ever find it? Oh, we forgot it. Oh, but would just one shoe be of any use to you, sir? My word, yes. If it was the right shoe... Here, Buster, find that shoe. It's the shoe! He's found it! Are oh, you clever dog, Buster! It may be the one. I can't tell without examining it. Anyone got a sharp pen knife? Here's one, sir. Thanks. I want to prize the heel away. Ah. Up it comes. It's here. This is it. A whole year's work. Invaluable. The thief must have seen the clothes in the box and thought everything was there. What a shock when he finds only one shoe. Perhaps he'll come back. You could catch him then. Oh, we know where to pick him up now. My word. Look at this name on the list. And that. Phew. This is going to make a stir. I do so hope you'll get Mr. Eurycles back some day. I have a feeling that once we get after the people on this list, our Mr. Eurycles will find himself unexpectedly free. Can't we give these children a reward for their enormous help? Oh, no, thank you. That would spoil everything. We wouldn't want to solve mysteries for a reward. Right. Still, there are two things I'm going to do for these finder-outers and dog. I'm going to send the biggest and juiciest bone to this clever dog. <coughs> and when Eurycles turns up, I'll ask him to give Frederick a few lessons in ventriloquism. Gosh, thank you, sir. The chief and his friend departed. Only Mr. Goon was left with the five children, and Fatty invited him to stay to tea. Mr. Goon was so astounded at this invitation, he could only gasp his thanks. It was a most hilarious tea, and Goon enjoyed himself too. Then, from just behind the astounded Mr. Goon, came an all-too-familiar voice. I never did it, I never... Oh, where's me auntie? Oh, Fatty, what are we to do with you? Why don't you tell us about the next mystery? Do. Do.